We'll now cover the third and final part of our discussion of the Android infrastructure middleware layers. Our attention here will focus on Android's runtime core libraries and native libraries. After we complete this part of the lesson, you should understand the key core Java libraries that are part of the Android platform, as well as understand the key core Android libraries that are part of the Android platform. You'll also recognize some of the key native libraries that are part of the Android platform as well. Apps typically use the core Java and Android libraries extensively. They tend not to use the native libraries quite as much, at least not directly. These are typically accessed through Java wrappers that appear in the core libraries or application framework layers. We'll start with an overview of the core Java libraries that are used in Android. Android contains many, though by no means all, of the core Java libraries that are found in the Java and Java X packages that are part of the standard Java platform. These include things like java.lang, java.util, java.io, java.util concurrent, and so on. If you take a look at the link at the bottom of this page, you'll be able to get a comparison that describes what's in Java and what's in Android and how they differ. From the point of view of concurrency and parallelism, which has been the focus of this course, some of the key packages include Java threads, which provide units of computation that run in the context of a process, as we've discussed before. We've also discussed, of course, that Java threads can communicate with each other by message passing or by using shared objects. Remember how each Java thread leverages some unique state from the underlying Linux kernel thread, such as a stack, a program counter, and other registers. And there's also some common state that's shared by threads within a process. These include things like the global heap, as well as memory that's stored in static storage. There's also a whole collection of Java synchronizers, including things like rendered locks, stamp locks, semaphores, condition objects, and phasers, which we really haven't covered much in this class, but we'll cover a lot more in next semester's course, if you happen to take it. These synchronizers are used for a variety of purposes. Most commonly, they're used to prevent race conditions, where there's corruption of data by different threads that are accessing the data in a shared way, using shared mutable state. There are lots of different ways to prevent these race conditions. One way, of course, are to use the synchronizers. Another way is to program using the various higher-level Java 8 concurrency and parallelism features, such as parallel streams or completable futures, or even the fork join framework that we talked about from Java 7, which can be used to partition the data in such a way that there is often little or no shared state. There's also a number of other APIs available in part of core Java that support networking, and these can be used to exchange data between Android devices or clients and various remote servers that typically execute out in the cloud somewhere. There's also a number of mechanisms that do perform various types of Java input and output operations, in particular operations that work on persistent files that can be used to store data persistently between runs of an application. There's also a number of core libraries that are part of Android that are not found as part of the standard Java platform. There are many of these classes. Naturally, all these classes that are part of Android's packages depend very heavily on the features and APIs that are provided by the underlying libraries that are copied from the Java platform. Some of the more interesting classes that are available in the Android packages include their concurrency mechanisms, which have a couple of different incarnations, one of which is called handlers, messages, and runnables, or hammer, the hammer framework. And in this framework, operations can run in one or more threads in the background and then publish the results to the user interface thread. There's also something called the async task framework, which is similar to the hammer framework, but it allows concurrency to run without directly having to program threads, handlers, messages, or runnables directly. You don't have to access those things directly. They're hidden from you by a nice object-oriented framework veneer that uses various patterns like the template method pattern and the wrapper, the, sorry, the facade pattern and the half sync, half async pattern in order to be able to reduce the surface area of concurrent complexity that you have to program to run things concurrently in an Android environment. There are also a number of app components. These include things that are the building blocks that Android uses to, to run applications in its architecture. These include activity, service, broadcast receiver, and content provider. 
as you may recall, activities or things that are user-facing that interact with the user. Services run in the background and typically do things that may have to access off-device resources, say in the cloud. Content providers are used to access persistent resources that are located on a device. And broadcast receivers are used to be notified when either something has happened or when you want something to happen. There are a number of hook methods that Android provides that can be used to control the app's lifecycle by calling back on these various components that are customized by application developers. Intents are essentially messages that are used to glue together activity, service, and broadcast receiver components. And an intent can be used to specify either something that's occurred, such as a, a, a system event has occurred, or perhaps the battery uh, value is low, the battery power is getting low. And they can also be used to command something to occur, such as to launch another activity. There's also a set of IPC framework capabilities that are provided known as the binder. We've talked about the binder from the point of view of the OS kernel layer before. There's also classes that are available in the Android platform runtime layers as part of the core Android libraries. And these are used to provide inter-process communication you rarely access these capabilities directly. Instead, they're typically handled indirectly by something called the Android Interface Definition Language, which is basically a toolkit that allows you to specify things declaratively in the form of interfaces that a tool called the AIDL compiler then compiles into proxies and stubs that interact with the binder IPC framework. This framework allows both synchronous and asynchronous communication between components residing on an Android device, say a client component and a server component. These components can either be co-located in the same address space or they can be split in different address spaces on the same device, communicating using the binder mechanisms. And there's a number of different variants of this. Some provide message-based communication, some provide method-based communication, and we'll cover all these mechanisms when we get to this topic in next semester's course. The source code for all the core Java and Android libraries is all available online. You can go to source.android.com and download it. It's available through GitHub. Note that the source code for the Android platform we're discussing here is released under a different license agreement than the source code that's available as part of the Android Linux portion of Android. And so that's actually available in a different repository because it has a different licensing regime. Let's now kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about the Android native C and C++ libraries that are part of the Android platform. Although Android apps are typically written using Java or more uh, recently Kotlin, implementations of the Java APIs are often, though by no means always, written in C and C++. And the reason for doing this is because there's a need to provide a balance between performance and productivity. Languages like C and C++ typically provide higher performance but are harder to program, so they're less productive, whereas Java or Kotlin are not as fast, not as efficient, but typically are easier to program because there's things like garbage collection and uh, memory checking that's not done as readily or as conveniently in, and productively in languages like C and C++, which are compiled directly to native code. You can interact between these different layers using something called the Java Native Interface, which defines a way for managed code, code written in Java, for example, to interact with native code, which is written in C or C++. And this is something that's available out of the box also with the Java platform. Basically provides a standard way for this managed code to interact with native code under the hood. If you want to go even further and program even more parts of your app using native code, there's something called the Android Native Development Kit, or the NDK. And this implements, this allows application developers to implement larger portions of their apps and or their app services using native C and C++ code. While it's not recommended to write your entire app using the NDK, you might consider using the NDK on portions of your code in order to help enhance performance by minimizing latency, maximizing throughput, conserving key system resources that are done more, uh, more optimally using the native code, if you're careful. Uh, the typical place you, you would find people using NDK-like capabilities would be in very performance-sensitive applications, such as gaming on mobile devices. 
I strongly, however, resist you, uh, I strongly encourage you to resist the urge to develop all of your apps using the NDK. That's usually an exercise in futility. Instead, write your app in Java or Kotlin, see how well it performs, find out if there's a bottleneck using profilers and debuggers and so on. And then if there is a bottleneck, go in there and maybe consider rewriting portions of it using the JNI or the NDK, if you need to. Another reason for using NDK is to make it easier to integrate existing C and C++ libraries into the Android apps. And that's where we turn our attention next. So there's a number of libraries that are provided as part of the Android stack. These are available in open source form and often have Java wrapper facades. But of course, the native code is available as part of the Android source release. One example of this would be the System C libraries, which are called the Bionic LibC, that enable developers of lower level parts of Android to write native system services for Android using C or C++ directly. There's something called the Surface Manager, which is used to composite 2D and 3D graphic layers for multiple apps in order to be able to display them on the device's screen. There's something called the Media Framework, known as Stage Fright, which supports audio video streaming in the background so you can watch a movie or listen to music without taking up too much of the CPU performance and without overly complicating the way your apps are developed. There's a library called FreeType for rendering fonts, renders bitmap and vector fonts, just doesn't require them to rewrite that stuff. It's complicated and tedious to do that, so why not reuse what's already there? There's an interesting framework called WebKit, which is very widely used on both mobile and non-mobile platforms for web browsing. WebKit was actually originally developed by Apple and is used in quite a number of mobile device environments, including, of course, iOS as well as Android. There's also something called OpenGL, which is a popular framework for being able to do 2D and 3D vector graphics, which is often used for gaming applications that you'd find on a phone. There's something called SQL Lite, which we will cover more in next semester, which is a relational database engine that implements the SQL or structured query language specification and performs various CRUD operations on persistent data, where CRUD stands for create, read, update, and delete. So it's a common way of being able to store various types of information persistently on an Android device. Uh, email uses this. The MMS SMS app uses this. Lots of apps use SQLite to store data to allow it to be queried and displayed in various ways. There also, of course, is a library called SSL, which stands for Secure Sockets Layer. And that's widely used on Android and other platforms to ensure confidentiality and integrity for web interactions, such as e-commerce, making it harder for people to uh, steal your password and other metadata about your account. Native C and C++ libraries, C++ libraries use many non-Java concurrency libraries, such as POSIX pthreads under the hood to do their work. Uh, you, again, rarely access that, if ever, access that directly in your typical Java apps or Kotlin apps. So that's the end of the infrastructure middleware discussion, focusing on the Android runtime core libraries and native libraries. And as we'll discuss next, when we talk about the highest layers, of the Android stack, the apps and application frameworks leverage all these lower level infrastructure middleware capabilities in order to simplify what they need to do in order to provide their services to the applications and the end users.